huge burden, wasn't it? Always tell the story of my testimony whenever I got up off my knees. It felt like a big burden had been lifted off my shoulders. And uh, uh, this song just brings me back to that. And so praise the Lord for removing that burden. He can remove that burden from anyone's heart, anyone's soul. Remove those sins that weigh us down so heavily. So we thank the Lord for it. So today, we just praise the Lord for the rain, the sunshine. We praise the Lord for allowing us to be here. And so uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. And after we do, uh, we'll take a few moments to meet and greet each other. And then uh, Jordan will come with the children's child. Bob, Brother Bobby, would you uh, uh, lead us in prayer this morning, please? Our Father, we pray for you in your house this morning. Thank you for your prayer. Thank you for your spirit. 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 Stand up, shake each other's hands, hug, tell them why you love them. So I've got some verses about the sword drills and tithing. But first, before I read it, I want to 
do this one. I told my dad this the other day. This one on the far corner, it's got a, a father and his son asking a question. He said, Dad, why do we only give God 10% and the waitress 15%? So, it's a pretty good thing to think about right there. Okay, kids. You ready for the sword drill? This is sword drill. Leviticus 27, 30 through 32. It's going to be in the front of your Bible. Leviticus 27, 30 through 32. Okay, Rachel. Tenth of it shall be into the Lord. Okay? Next point. Kids, we need to love God back. Galatians 2.20. That's going to be in the back of your Bible. Okay, go. Galatians 2.20. crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ that liveth in me, and the life which now I live in the flesh, by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Okay, I think this is the adults. Yep, adults. Okay, you ready, adults? John 19, 24. Go. Okay. 
page 421. We see the first and third verses of this book. Page 421.
can't thank you enough, dear Lord. Thank you for the son and, and uh, for everything you do for us here. Uh, we ask you to uh, be with this little church. And we thank you for the blessings you have bestowed upon this little church and what you have done for it. And uh, we, we ask you to uh, send our speaker today and guide them. And, and may our minds and hearts be open to receive the word that we will hear from this young man today. Dear Lord. We thank you again, Miss Family. Thank you for everything you do for us. Jesus, Jesus, name we pray last.
That's probably more special than others. Good job. Jews which came to Mary 
and had seen the things which Jesus did, believed on him. As we've gone through the book of John, we see this illustration throughout. We see that the miracles that Jesus did brought people to him, and then we see that the miracles of Jesus, some did not come to him. And so we see here that some believed on him after they saw him raise, Jesus, or raise Lazarus from the dead. It says, but some of them went their ways to the Pharisees and told them what things Jesus had done. What do we call these people that do that? Missionaries. Missionaries, not missionaries. We're looking for a negative word here. When somebody goes and tells on somebody from doing something, what do we call them? A tattletale, right? And so we see the Pharisees here are calling, are going to be tattletales, okay? Uh, as parents, we don't like tattletales, do we? Uh, we tell them, uh, we want people to kind of take care of things on their own. Quit being a tattletale. Every time I turn around, you're being a tattletale. You're telling on somebody for something. And uh, I've said that a few times throughout my fatherhood. And so I'm sure I'll say it a few more times throughout my fatherhood. And so we see here that they were kind of being tattletales per se. But, you know, we see the people here when they come before Christ. And they see that these miracles have been taken or have been seen and done. And we see that it says in verse 45 at the end that believed on Him. We see some that came and turned to Jesus. They turned to the cross. We see some that ignored His miracles. They were all about themselves and not about what was really going on. We see times throughout the Scriptures where many spoke uh, out, of, out of order, per se. You know, because they, they were thinking more of the flesh than they were of the spiritual need here. You know... We see here that uh, there's times throughout the Scriptures and we see it throughout Revelations where the church is going to leave the scene, okay? And then we'll see where there's periods of great miracles that happen during that time. You know, and even during that time, some still were not convinced of the Lord Jesus Christ and who He is and that He was the Messiah. Some will follow after the Antichrist. Some will after after. The, the, those that are false. And so, as we see here, we see that some will follow and some will not follow. You know, Jesus died, He was buried, and He rose again. That is something that we, that we should look at and see that the example of. That there is proof of the Messiah. And the Messiah says who He is. That is proof in itself. That is the gospel that we share uh, locally here and also throughout the world. And so we see that we are to share that gospel with everyone. You know, there's, there's not really a miracle that was needed here, but we see that it was provided through the salvation of Jesus Christ. And so, you know, the problem is not the lack of evidence. The evidence is there that Jesus was born, He came, He served, He ministered to others, and He also died on the cross as it described in the uh, the prophets of old and Isaiah and those before and the evidence was provided that he died he was buried and he rose again just like it was prophesied and so it's not that there's not any evidence the problem is that it is unbelief on the heart of man that unbelief it is our unbelief you know it is fact it is true that Jesus died was buried and rose again and is at the right hand of the Father but men do not want to believe that and do not understand that. It is the lack of unbelief of man on our own part. And so here it says, But some of them went their ways to the Pharisees and told them what things Jesus had done. Verse 47 says, Then gathered the chief priests and the Pharisees a council, came together, a group, a body came together and said, What do we, for this man doeth many miracles? They were opposed they did not accept what Jesus was doing and what He was all about. What can we do to get rid of this man? We have meetings, don't we? We have a business meeting following. We have a business meeting once a month to, to talk about things and things in the past and things to come and how we want to take care of things. But there's also times when we schedule a kind of an emergency meeting and something needs to be taken care of right then, right now. And so they, this was kind of an emergency meeting for them to have. The council that came together and it says that they, what do we do with this man that doth many miracles? They were opposed against him. They, they didn't want to accept him. Verse 48, if we let him thus alone, all men will believe on him. That was their problem. 
If we leave him alone, eventually men are going to believe on him and accept him. And they didn't want that, did they? Their teachings were opposite of what Christ's teachings were. They wanted people to look at them. They didn't want people to look at Jesus. They did not want people to look at the cross. Okay? They wanted the people to look at them. They wanted to be drawn by man. They were looking for the acceptance of man. With as Christians, we don't look for the, the, the acceptance of the world, do we? We look towards the heavens and look for the acceptance of Jesus Christ who accepts us who we are, no matter what color, what nationality, no matter who we are, we are accepted by Christ with open arms. It says, Rome, Romans shall come and take away both our place and nation. They were fearing, okay? They were fearing. It keeps from Jesus, Christians will follow after Him. They will stand for the truth. As believers, we need to stand for the truth. We need to stand up for God. Because God accepts us, wants us to. He expects us to stand up for Him. We are His sons and daughters. We need to stand up for Him. You know what? A lot of times fear in our own hearts keeps us from following Jesus. Fear of the world keeps us from following Jesus. There's many people out there today that will not accept Jesus or will not come to Jesus because they are fearful. They are fearful because why? Number one, I think, is because they are fearful and where Christ will lead them. Okay? Christ is going to lead them to good. We that accept Christ know that. But before that, did you accept Christ when the first time you heard the gospel? Most of us know we didn't. Because we had a little fear in us. What's going to happen? Uh, a lot of times people are afraid of changing their life. Okay? It's going to change their life. It's going to make them a new person. They don't want to give that up. They want to continue to follow and live the life that they're living. And it says in verse 49, And one of them named Caiaphas, being the high priest that same year, said unto them, Ye know nothing at all, nor consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people, and that the whole nation perish not. And so we see here Caiaphas is on the scene, the high priest of that time, said to him, Ye don't know anything at all. It says, Nor consider that it is expedient for us, to mean quickly, that one man should die for the people. One man. Isaiah 53 8 tells us here as I flip over. Isaiah 53 8. That one man. It says, He was taken from prison and from judgment, who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. So who was stricken? Jesus was stricken. He was nailed to the cross for what? For the transgression of my people. It also talks of that in, also in John chapter 18, verse 14. John 18, 14. Just flip a few pages to your right and it tells us there. It says that now Caiaphas was he which gave counsel to the Jews that it was expedient that one man should die for the people. And that one man that he's speaking of here is Jesus Christ. It says... It says, And this spake he not of himself, but being high priest that he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation. And not for that nation only, but that also he should gather together in one of the children of God that was scattered abroad. And so he was making a he was prophesying here. He was speaking. You don't know anything. This man's going to die for the whole world. This one man for the transgressions of the sin. You know, Jesus didn't die, not die for the nation. But what did He die for? He died for everyone, everybody, everyone in the whole world. He didn't die just for the United States of America. He didn't die just for Rome. He died for everybody, every single individual. He didn't die just for the Jews, but He died for the Gentiles as well. Every single person did He die for. You know, they succeeded in putting Him to death. You know why they succeeded? Because it was the will of God for him to be put to death, to go to the cross, to die for the sins of the world. And we see here that he speaks of the nation of Rome here in the Scriptures. You know, during that time, that Rome didn't perish, but it was a few years later that Rome perished, didn't they? The whole nation was wiped out. And he talks about that in Titus, where it talks about where it says Titus destroyed in A.D. 70 were a whole nation of Rome. And so, as we see here, it says, And not for the nation only, but that also he should gather together 
and won the children of God that was scattered abroad. And we see that years after that nation of Rome was destroyed, which was a powerful nation during that time. In verse 53, and then from that day forth they took counsel together to put him to death. So they had the idea that they were going to work together to put him to death. In verse 54, Jesus therefore walked no more openly among the Jews, but went thence unto a country near to the wilderness, into a city called Ephraim, and there continued with his disciples. Here we see that the end is near for Jesus and his ministry. It is getting closer and closer to the time when Christ is going to give his life for all mankind. The end of his life is near. And so we see here that he departed and went out into Ephraim and there continued with his disciples. And the Jews' Passover was nigh at hand. And many went out of the country up to Jerusalem before the Passover to purify themselves. We see that some of them, or most of these people during this time, this was just a ritual that they went through. This was just going through the motions, if you know what I mean. And so here, that it was that time of year, they needed to go purify themselves, they needed to follow the, the ritual, they needed to go do the things that they were taught as young children, as, they were, as the Passover is near. They, most of these people used this as a time to rub shoulders with each other, if you know what I mean. And so here, they, this is what happened. And so we see that the Passover meant a certain thing to many people. And, but some, it, did, it was just a ritual. Their opinions were different. Everyone that gathered during this time, they had different opinions. And so here, not only during this time, but also throughout different times, we see that some believed on Christ. We see that some had the opinion not to believe on Christ. And so here, verse 55 speaks a little bit of that, that some came to purify themselves as a ritual. Some came to purify themselves in the true meaning of giving honor and glory to the Lord for things that happened to them in the past. And so, in verse 56, it said, Then sought they for Jesus and spake among themselves, as they stood in the temple, What think ye that he will not come to the feast? And so they're questioning themselves here. Will he come? Will he not come? Will he come and be amongst the people? Will he not come and be present? And so verse 57 says, Now both the chief priest and the Pharisees had given a commandment that if any man knew where he were, he should show it that they might take him. And so as they come amongst the people and going through the crowds, if you see Jesus, let us know. If you see Jesus, tell him where he is. So forth and so on. Going throughout, making a commandment to the people that were present. If this man comes amongst you, come and let us know. Come and tell us where he is. You know, we see that throughout time of history, all the way back in Genesis, we see Moses speaking of the Lord Jesus. We see the prophets of Isaiah speaking of Moses. We see Elijah, Elijah. We see all the prophets of the Old Testament prophesying of Jesus, that He is to come. He is the Messiah. He is the one and only true God. He will come and save the world from their sin. Even between when Moses taught, there were people there that believed, and there were people there that did not believe. There were people that praised God. There were people that did not praise God. Uh, even now that Jesus is right in their midst, right in front of them, speaking the Father's will, telling them who He is, I am the bread of life. I am, uh, I am the spiritual water. I am the water that you need that you will not thirst of any longer. I am the Son of God. He has mentioned this over and over and over and over again. Many times there are still people that do not believe. We see here that this is the last week of His earthly life for Christ here as it leads up to the cross and those things that follow after it. And so we see the importance here that Jesus has come. He has told them. He says in verse 42 in the previous chapter, And I knew that thou hearest me always, but because of people which stand by, I said it that I may believe, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. His goal, his ministry, was to do the will of God the Father. What is your goal? What is your will in your life? 
Is it your goal and your will to do the will of the Father? Or it is to chase after your own dreams and your own expectations? We have expectations in our life, but is your expectations to follow after God, to follow after the Lord Jesus, or is it to follow after your own selfish desires? And so here we see that the chief priest and the Pharisees, their own selfish desire was to destroy the ministry of Jesus and to destroy Him and put Him to death. Jesus, on the other hand, His desire was to follow after God the Father. And that should be all of our desire, is to follow after the will of the Father who has sent us. And as we get into chapter 12 here, it says, Then Jesus, excuse me, Six days before the Passover came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, which had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. There they made him a supper, and Martha served. But Jesus, or but Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. And so uh, most of the time as we gather at fellowships and we gather together, uh, we kind of see this picture here being painted as well, that Jesus came and he gathered with Lazarus, his buddy, and gathered, gathered around some people that uh, that were following after him. And we see that Martha was here uh, that was serving. They made him a supper and Martha served. But Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table. So it's kind of painting an illustration for us. We have Lazarus and Jesus. And we have others here. And we have Martha serving. What are the, most of the times when we see Martha's name mentioned, what is she doing throughout the scripture? She's serving, isn't she? She was putting on a character, characteristic of a servant. You know, each one of us here have a different character, have a different, uh, what do you call it, a different uh, spiritual gift. Thank you. Brother Bill picked me up this morning. Kathy picked me up here this day, here or now. And so, a spiritual gift. Each one of us have a spiritual gift. Some of us are servants. Some of us are organizers. Uh, some of us are this and that. It doesn't matter. I mean, we all put on a different spiritual gift. But here we see Martha's spiritual gift was to serve. Okay? What is your spiritual gift? Do you know what your spiritual gift is? If not, pray to the Lord that He will reveal that spiritual gift to you because He will. Some of you know what your spiritual gift is and you don't even know it. You know what I mean? And so here, Martha was a servant. Uh, I, myself, uh, through through the study of the Word and the Scriptures and through a study that we did as a family, uh, I've been narrowed down as a server. Kathy's been narrowed down as an organizer. Each one of our kids have different. I think Jordan's was a teaching, wasn't it? And so, uh, I don't remember what the other ones were, but the, uh, if you if you want to go through that study, just get with Kathy and she'll give you that information. So if you don't know and you want to know what your spiritual gift is, and like you said, you can look at it and you say, Oh, Lord, I don't know what my spiritual gift is. But, uh, oh yeah, I do know what it is after the Lord reveals it to you through different things. And so here we see that Martha was a servant. How many of you believe that we all should be a servant one way or the other? Amen, right? We talked about that in James this morning. We need to be on the character of serving others. Jesus was a servant. He served others. And so it says, And then took Mary a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly. Okay, very costly here. It says, and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the odor of ointment. How many of you have, uh, we have essential oils around our house. How many of you have ever opened an ointment or an oil, and it just, oh, you know, you're just like, it just smells so good, doesn't it? And you just breathe it in. And just, I don't know, it just meets that sensory that you have. And so here, that's kind of what they feel here. You know, we see here that it talks about and describes Martha, or Mary. Martha is being a servant. And it speaks of Mary taking this ointment and pretty much serving Jesus. You know, as Martha stands for service and Lazarus for a communion, so Mary shows us the worship of a grateful heart. Others before her had come to his feet to have their need met. She came to give him his due, though two of the evangelists recorded her act. John alone gives her a name. Throughout the scriptures, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the four gospels, they all describe this. But here, John gives her a name, telling us who exactly did this. Did we come? To the Lord Jesus to 
give him honor where it is due? Or do we come just for ourselves? Mary came to give honor where honor was due. This ointment was not just a cheap, great value brand ointment, if you know what I mean. This was an ointment that was very, very costly, it tells us here in the Bible. It tells us that it was very costly. And that she took that ointment and the feet of Jesus and wiped it not with her hands or not with a cloth, but she wiped it with her hair. Took her hair and wiped his feet with this. That's a more personal touch, don't you think? Than just taking a cloth and wiping it. She got personal with the Lord Jesus. How long has it been since we've been personal with the Lord Jesus? What about today? Are you personal with the Lord Jesus? not in time, in just a few minutes the boys are going to come for a time of invitation and these altars will be open. That is a time that we get personal. Well, Jesus, you can get personal right here, right now with Him. Has He spoken to your heart? Are you ignoring His convictions? Or are you allowing Him to work within you? It says, Then saith one of His disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray Him, why was not this one that sold for 300 pence and given to what was his goal there? Who was Judas Iscariot? Not only was it trade, but he was also who? He was the treasurer, wasn't he? He would have the money signs in his mind. Okay? It's all about money to him. It's not about money. It's about service. We have two opposite ends here. We see one they didn't care about the cost. She was given honor where honor was due. We see Judas, Judas, on the other hand, that cared about the cost. It says, This he said, not that he cared for the poor, because he was a thief and had the bag, and bare what was put therein. He cared about the bottom line. We're going to be in a business meeting here in just a little bit. What are we looking at? Look at the bottom line, though. We look to see what the operation is. Are we spending too much money? Do we have enough money? Mary didn't care what the bottom line was. She didn't care how much that ointment cost. She cared about giving Jesus the honor and glory that he deserved by taking this ointment and wiping his feet with it. Sometimes it's not about the money. It's about what we need to do to serve others, to minister to others, and to give Jesus Christ the honor where honor is due. Then Jesus said, Let her alone against the day of my burial, hath she kept this. For the poor will always ye have with you, but with me, he had not always. Much people of the Jews therefore knew that he was there, and they came not for Jesus' sake only, but they might see Lazarus also, whom he had raised from the dead. But the chief priests consulted that they might put Lazarus also to death, because that by reasons of him many of the Jews went away and believed in Jesus. They had it in their mind. They were going to put Jesus to death. We see that many believed on Christ. They came to know Christ as Savior through the miracles of Lazarus being raised from the dead. And we also see now that the chief priests and the Pharisees now not only want to put Jesus to death, but put Lazarus to death also. Because why? Because he was an example of the work that Jesus had done through the will of Father Himself. We need to be an outwardly example of what Jesus Christ has done for us inside. We need to be representing that outwardly. Lazarus was an outwardly example of the miracle that Jesus does. 
Salvation is a miracle. Because we are changed completely from the inside out. Praise the Lord for that. Praise God. Amen. And so as we look at this, and we look at Christ and the miracles that He has done, are we serving Him? As Martha has illustrated here. And are we giving honor and honor where it is due? As Mary represented that, not only did she represent that, but she represented a personal, getting personal, a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus. Have you personally met Him today? Is He speaking to you? Always come and lead us in a song of invitation. As we all stand, 521, Jesus paid it all. 524, 524, Jesus paid it all. He paid it all for you. He paid it all for me. Are you willing to accept that this morning? If you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, today is the day of salvation. Come at the feet of the cross and give your life to Him. Are you here today when you're away from Jesus? He's waiting for you to come back with open arms to accept you today. Maybe you're here today without a church home. The Lord has been working on your heart and asking you to come and join us here at Gethsemane Missionary Baptist Church. We'd love to have you. We'd accept you with open arms. No matter who you are, we would accept you. Come as you are. Jesus paid it all. Boys. <laughs>
Sunday school, but I think you can get up just a little bit earlier to come and enjoy a great breakfast with each other. So it's for everybody, kids, grandkids. Uh, bring your uh, fathers, bring your uh, wives. We're going to come and have a, a breakfast together. And so next Sunday, remember it, mark your calendars at 9 o'clock. Come and have breakfast and uh, we'll have a great time of fellowship there as well. Revelation Senior is going to be here June 15th. We have a flyer up on the uh, door up there and one back here. They're going to be leading the music next uh, week, uh, next weekend. And so uh, just come and be a part of that. We'll be taking up a love offering for them as well. And uh, family night, uh, Wednesday, June 25th, pizza and games following the services. We'll have a, our Bible study that we normally have on uh, Wednesday nights. So and we'll have some uh, pizza and games following that also for the kids. Last time that we uh, hosted this, we had 20. And so praise the Lord for that. So let's see if we can build on that number next time, or this time as well. So tell everyone in your neighborhood and uh, let them know and uh, bring a guest with you uh, on June 25th. Uh, uh, not only June 25th, but maybe next week, bring a guest with you as well. And so uh, just be prayer for that and as God leads us in that way. And also, a new Wednesday evening program, Keepers of the Faith, starting July. And so uh, just uh, just remember that as well. And that's for all. That's for uh, boys, girls, moms, dads, everyone. We want everyone to be involved in that. Uh, grandma, grandpa, no matter who it is. We're not going to be any respected people, right? We're not going to be partial. It's going to be for everybody. And so uh, come.